Good evening and welcome to our virtual public meeting for the Arbor Way Parkways Improvement Project. Um, my name is Nate Lash and um, just want to thank you all for, for spending your time and, and energy to be here with us this evening. Um, we're all very excited to be here. Um, and to kick us off for the meeting, I'm going to um, pass the virtual mic over to Jenny Norwood from DCR. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Arbor Way Parkway Improvement Improvements Project public meeting. Um, next slide. Uh, just a heads up, some um, uh, housekeeping to take care of before we get started. Uh, we want to let you know that this meeting is being recorded and it will be a public record. Uh, we will allow, we have a question and answer period built in at the end. We ask please that you hold your questions until that period starts since we have so many attendees. Please use the questions function or raise your hand if you have a question. We like to leave the chat open for um, attendees to chat amongst themselves and so the panelists can chat amongst ourselves as well. Next slide. We will, um, after the welcome, we'll have um, Jeff Parenti walk through short-term improvements, project background, uh, the public outreach and the input we've gotten so far, some alternatives, and then we'll go to next steps. Next slide. On behalf of Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and EEA Secretary Theoharides, and DCR Commissioner Jim Montgomery, we welcome you tonight. We also welcome uh, a number of folks from the city of Boston who are, are um, joining us, as well as Isabel Torres from Representative El Aguardo's office and Natalie Kauf Kaufman from Representative Malia's office. Uh, any legislators, if you would like to say a few words at the beginning of Q&A, please chat me and I will. Um, we will open the mic up for you then. Now I'd like to hand off to Deputy Chief Engineer, Jeff Parenti. Jeff? Thank you very much, Jenny, and good evening, everybody. And thank you for being with us tonight. My name is Jeff Parenti, and my role at DCR is manager of the statewide Parkways program. Arborway is one of several active Parkways improvement projects currently under design. And tonight, DCR is pleased to share with you three concept plans for Arborway. Our consulting transportation engineering team will show you the major features of each of them, and you will have the rest of the meeting to ask clarifying questions and make comments. After this meeting, of course, there will be a public comment period. In my opinion, all three concepts we will show you tonight achieve the goals of the project, but they do so in different ways. I want to note that what we are looking at tonight are conceptual sketches and not engineering designs. While they were produced with computer-aided design tools, and they are to scale and they do look like engineering plans, they are not. We couldn't build anything with these plans even if we wanted to. These sketches are intended only to help us start discussion. These plans will be modified several times following your comments and changes by the design team. So if you see something tonight that offends you, please don't panic, just point it out to us so that we're aware of it. You know this corridor better than we do and we expect that you will notice things that the design team may have missed. While this meeting is our second with our designer, Howard Stein Hudson, which we hired in February, there have been many more meetings in Arbor Way going back several years. So you have attended meetings like this before and I imagine in other projects as well. What is different tonight is the format. We met in person at the Faulkner Hospital back in November, but our last, be our last meeting in June was virtual. This is a new experience for all of us. For people on the panel like me, we can't see anyone in the audience. We don't know if you're nodding at something we say or frowning or cheering or booing us. It's hard for us to read the room and you can't see each other. You don't have a sense for which way your, ne which way your neighbors may be leaning as we go through the meeting. Further, we may not have time to get to all of your questions and comments tonight. We have over 200 people registered for this meeting. And so if you have clarifying questions that we didn't cover in this meeting, Please send them to us and the design team will answer them for you in the next couple of days. As you know, we'll hear many perspectives tonight. Some of you will dis some of some of these you will disagree strongly with. You already know that it's important to respect all opinions you hear, and it's a reminder that there is no design concept that we can craft that will appeal to each and every one of you. 
Achieving unanimous approval for any one of these concepts is just not possible. We will need to make several compromises and trade-offs to get to a preferred concept that satisfies as many stakeholders as we can. Getting to a preferred alternative that we can take to full design starts tonight. The most useful types of comments we can hear from you at this meeting are general as opposed to detailed. If there is an alternative, is there an alternative that you believe should be eliminated outright or one that you feel is far superior to the other two? Are there design approaches at a particular section that you like or don't like? If you ask a question that is too detailed for this early stage, I will let you know there are hundreds of design details that will be worked out later in the development project. So I have the, the mission statement on, this, on the screen right now. DCR's mission is to, of course, to protect, promote, and enhance our commonwealth of natural, cultural, and recreational resources for the well-being of all. And that's this is the, the central theme that guides our project and that led to the goals of the project that we have formed at, at previous meetings. Next slide. So before we get into the, the redesign, I want to go, I want to take a few minutes to go over the short-term improvements that are currently underway. Um, you have probably noticed our sidewalk crews and our resident engineer, Mike Vickery. Some of you have had the pleasure of meeting him. He is in charge of the Newport crew that is replacing many of the sidewalk sections. That work is winding down and will be completed with that soon. Uh, and many of you have also submitted comments to the short-term improvements for pavement markings that we posted on the website recently. Uh, when we, see, we received quite a bit of response to those, we have 39 pages of comments on our pavement marking plan. We have revised that plan based on your comments and based uh, uh, after we have final approval to on the edited plan, we do we would like to execute that plan and put those markings down before the winter. So that is coming as well. Those two short-term improvement items, the sidewalk and the pavement marking improvements are underway. I would like to stick tonight to the long-term improvements, the redesign. If you have questions about the short-term improvements for me, please send them to mass.parks at mass.gov and I'll get you an answer to that. I'd like to spend our limited time tonight talking about the redesign if we can. One more slide. So before I hand it to Howard St. Hudson, our design engineer, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the design team. Many of them are on the panel tonight. On the DCR side, the first three people, starting with myself, we are civil engineers, and we have many years of experience in with uh, roadway improvement projects like this one. And then of course, our communications team, Jenny Norwood, who you heard from earlier, and Ann Fessinger, our director of public outreach. I have been instrumental on the DCR side. And then our design engineer, Howard Stein Hudson, you're gonna hear from Matt Jasmine in just a minute. He is the project manager. You heard from Nate Lash earlier. Bob Stathopoulos is our traffic engineering lead, and you'll hear from him in a second. Amy Ingalls is an expert in active transportation, and Richard Houghton is from our landscape architect, Halverson. So we're really excited to have this team for you. This is the same team that we that was in front of you in June and will be the same going forward. So I'm excited to hand now to Matt Jasmine who will take you through the three alternatives that we have for you tonight. Thanks, Jeff. I'm actually gonna transition over uh, first to our public involvement staff, Nate Lash, and he's gonna bring us through where we started, how we got all the information, <clears throat> which was the core tools uh, for developing these alternatives. So, Nate, you're up. Thanks, Matt. Um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, there have been various um, iterations of this project for a very long time. Um, and also, as Jeff mentioned, Howard Stein Hudson came on board in February. Um, so in the spring, we met with elected officials and, and community stakeholders. Um, those were virtual meetings and, um, you know, to, to really pick, pick people's brains um, and, and get a sense of, of um, sort of the context and, and where, uh, where things are and, and where, where things stand in terms of um, the community and, and just sort of overall feelings towards the project. Um, that work allowed us to, to go into our virtual public meeting, which happened in June of the summer. 
uh, where we collected public comments and then after that had uh, some site walks, um, which was the first time we were able to do some face-to-face -face interaction and engagement um, for this project. If you go to the next slide, Matt, um, this is just a, a breakdown of um, some of the numbers of all the comments we received. So um, in June and July, we received over 500 public comments about the Arbor Way. Um, and the image on the right side of your screen um, shows the social pinpoint map, the interactive mapping tool we use to gather comments. And you can see all of the different comments there at Murray Circle that folks uh, submitted. Um, and, and you can see the breakdown of how we got different comments. We really wanted to make sure that however folks felt comfortable expressing and sharing their feedback with us, uh, we were getting that feedback. Um, and so what we did is we analyzed all of those 515 comments into uh, some different categories. And you'll see that on the next slide. Um, so those general categories were things that people like, you know, the, the assets, the things that um, you know, people really value and enjoy along the corridor today. Um, some safety issues, the things that, that folks feel are, are unacceptable in, in terms of safety, ideas and suggestions that people had um, for how to make improvements, and, and then just sort of general other comments, things we should be aware of and considering as we approach the design. Um, I'm not going to read out all of these here, but um, some of the highlights is, you know, for the safety issues, people expressed safety issues uh, of all users, so drivers, pedestrians, um, people, people on bikes. Um, there are there are safety issues all along the corridor for all kinds of users, and the ideas that people shared generally matched those those issues, um, and and we got a lot of ideas and and suggestions for how to make this a safer and more accessible corridor for all users. You can go to the next slide, Matt. Um, in June, we shared uh, some some project goals that we had developed. Um, that were derived from those conversations we had with community stakeholders, with elected officials, and in the public meeting. Um, and by and large, the the comments we received um, really did match those shared goals. And and so these goals we um, we use them to help guide the design process. Um, but before we show their alternatives and and the designs that that we're thinking about, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the project area and context itself. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Bob Sethopoulos. Bob, I think you're muted. Thanks, Nate. I got to uh, remember to unmute myself, so I apologize for that. Um, well, thank you, Nate. Uh, I would like to add to what I had mentioned before about our what our effort had been has been to date um, on gathering information about the project area and specifically on those uh, safety issues, the safety concerns. Uh, we had also done a, um, a road safety audit back in 2019, where we even, where we heard specifically about all the safety issues that uh, concern people uh, throughout this uh, project area. So we have definitely used many different tools in order to gather all this information, and uh, you know, uh, specifically on safety, um, and we were able to to um, uh, see some common themes emerge out of all this information. Um, uh, that we, we gathered. And as you can see on this slide, uh, there are things that we've uh, basically mentioned in the past as well. Uh, and those things kind of be in the uh, high speeds throughout the corridor, especially during the hours outside of commuting to work, uh, as there's less traffic traveling through here, uh, missing pavement markings and confusing geometry uh, throughout the corridor, as well as uh, areas where uh, as people are trying to get to their specific lane in order to get to their specific destination, uh, there, those distances uh, between uh, where they enter and try to change lanes, uh, the merging and the weaving basically, are pretty short areas. And that's uh, where we've also seen uh, crashes happen uh, from uh, crash reports we were able to gather. Um, and finally, um, the big general theme was like the, the, like, the lack of better, safer, and, uh, and up to code pedestrian and uh, bicycle accommodations or the connectivity, the missing connectivity. Um, so these were the safety concerns at least uh, that um, we tried to um, we, we used in order to develop our three uh, alternatives that uh, you're going to be seeing in a little bit in order to improve all these uh, things that uh, you can see over here as much as possible. Um, as Amy will be uh, speaking a little bit later on towards the um, pedestrian and bicycle commendations issue, 
Uh, I would like to uh, wrap up my part of the presentation, at least talking a little bit about the uh, movement of traffic um, uh, through the area under each one of these alternatives. Um, so uh, what uh, do we uh, look into doing under each one of these alternatives? <clears throat> we, we try to uh, maintain a steady flow of traffic through the project area. We know today that uh, uh, drivers are uh, provided with uh, an option uh, once they get at Mary Circle or Kelly Circle, uh, either to use the, the carriageways or to use the uh, mainline arbor way. So they have a good uh, four lane section in either direction to uh, um, travel through pretty fast this part of the area, uh, the, 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 start, the project area, in order to get from Mary Circle to Kelly Circle. However, once they get at either end, they still uh, get to a stop as they end up getting behind some queued up congested traffic uh, during those peak hours of traffic. Um, so what we looked to do was, uh, you know, provide a steady flow of traffic so you don't have to speed through a specific area and just get behind another congested part of uh, the the, uh, the corridor and wait over there. So the steady flow of traffic we're trying to maintain is you can keep moving through our area and hopefully through the rest of the air outside of our project area as you don't get behind congested uh, traffic there. Um, then we also try to balance the improvements that we're proposing throughout our project area. Uh, so we're not only looking at improving one mode, but we're looking at uh, providing improvements for all modes of traffic. Um, uh, then uh, we also are looking at streamlining the direction of traffic. What I mean uh, about this is direct traffic correctly and more appropriately into the right roadway. Um, as you know, today you get into Kelly Circle or even Murray Circle. Um, you are kind of given that choice: should I go the carriageway, should I go the uh, the, the mainline arbor way? So we're trying to um, direct that more into uh, the appropriate roadway. And at the same time, what that uh, will also try to do is separate commuting and local traffic. Um, as you will see in the alternatives, uh, the access to the, the, the carriageway was focused, the carriageways is focused more toward uh, getting local traffic in there to use it, uh, whereas the commuting traffic is, uh, will, will be directed towards the uh, main line. Um, and access to and from some of the neighboring streets uh, may get a little bit uh, harder for everyone, not only for commuting traffic, but that's um, uh, on purpose as we're trying to not get commuting traffic to cut through a lot of these uh, neighbor, uh, neighboring streets and all these neighborhoods there uh, that are adjacent to the Arbor Way. Uh, so uh, people don't uh, use them as cut-throughs if they end up getting into a congested um, uh, spot through the Arbor Way. So I will pass it over to Amy right now to speak uh, about uh, our thought process around the pedestrian and bicycle accommodations. Thanks, Bob. Um, so as Bob spoke to a uh, slide before this uh, about a bunch of different safety issues, uh, many of them were are related to inadequate access um, and connectivity, particularly for non-motorized users. Uh, currently, there really aren't very many legal or safe opportunities to cross the multiple lanes of the Arbor Way and this impedes access for bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, oftentimes people on bike will be stuck on one side of the road um, and they can't get to the other side of the road, which is where the travel lanes going in their desired direction are. Um, and then so you end up seeing people riding either against the flow of traffic on the road, which you can see in the bottom picture here, um, in the carriageways that tends to happen, or people uh, riding bikes on the narrow sidewalks, which obviously pedestrians are on there too, and that can sometimes cause some conflicts. Um, not to mention that this area is a noticeable gap in the high quality bike network that the city has been building out um, in recent years. Um, to the north, we have a beautiful shared use path along the Jamaica Way. And to the south, we have excellent separated bikeways complemented by sidewalks along Casey Arbor Way. Next. And speaking of uh, bikeways versus shared use paths, um, I want to note that most parts of the three concepts that we're going to show you tonight allow for a choice between either a shared use path where bicyclists and pedestrians and all non-motorized modes uh, share the same space or a two-way separated bike facility adjacent to a sidewalk, giving bikes and pedestrians their own space. Um, you know, there are different pluses and minuses for both of these options and each can be appropriate in different uh, settings. 
Um, but we wanted to let you know that for the as many times as often as possible, we will um, allow for that choice to be made um, in all three of the design uh, alternatives that we're going to show you today. But of course, we also know that a high quality bikeway or path is really only as safe and comfortable as the intersections that it runs through. So um, we all obviously need to do a bunch of different treatments to the intersections and crossings to make sure that we are um, reducing the number of motor vehicle conflicts. And um, when we have to have some motor vehicle conflicts um, remain, we wanna make sure that those occur at a low uh, travel speed. Next. And so, oh, no, this one, <laughs> stay on that one, sorry. Um, go back to the crossing one, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, so while it's too soon, you know, to obviously say exactly what kinds of treatments we're going to have at the intersections, um, we wanted to give you a menu tonight of some different options that we'll pull from. Uh, this is not comprehensive, um, and we're not saying necessarily that we're going to use all of these, but um, we just wanted to show you a couple different um, things that we'll be thinking about as we uh, approach the intersections. And if you have questions about any of the ones you're seeing here um, or any others, um, you can put those in the uh, chat box or raise your hand to um, do the question and answer session. Um, again, it's too soon to say which, which of these we'll be using in any particular crossing or intersection, but when the time comes, we will analyze each location individually and determine which treatments are most, most appropriate um, and which would provide the greatest safety benefit. All right, thank you, Amy. Uh, we want to take the opportunity to talk about a, another very important aspect of this project, which is the uh, historic um, considerations related to the Arbor Way. And, the, and as uh, many of us are aware, the Arbor Way is part of Boston's Emerald Necklace, which is a system of connected parks in Boston. And Olmsted's vision, vision was for parkways to be connectors of park spaces, and in the case of the Arbor Way, linking uh, Jamaica Pond to Franklin Park and in the um, in the context of this specific project, um, the Forest Hills area, um, Arbor Way was uh, designed in 1892 and implemented a few years later, uh, which was just before automobiles really uh, came to, um, you know, become the uh, really uh, overtake uh, the uh, commuting and, and movement through the city. So uh, there have been obviously been a lot of change over time, and the character of the Arbor Way was to be a park-like experience while focusing on linearity and connect connectivity and using natural features and plantings to enhance and frame views in the case of uh, parkways, specifically implementing a regular rhythm of trees, which currently uh, characterizes uh, some limited parts of the Arbor Way. And the design uh, of Parkways was also intended to provide separation of modes of travel. Uh, so originally separation between walking paths, carriageways, bridle paths, uh, and separating with rows of trees. And it is also notable that the rotaries within the Arbor Way were constructed later, uh, Murray in uh, 1932 and Kelly Circle in 1943. So if we move to the next slide, uh, which talks uh, uh, a little bit more about the existing tree canopy and uh, right Right now, there are about 280 trees total in the uh, main areas along the boulevard, and 80% are red oak, and almost 80% are in, in fair to good condition uh, based on a 2015 publication in which every tree was assessed by an arborist. Over 40% of the trees are above 30 inches in diameter, so quite large, uh, and there's a very minimal amount of invasive species. So Norway maples and other opportunistic trees haven't haven't really come in and taken over to a great degree. So that's not a, a big concern within the context of, of this project. If we move to the next slide, uh, this uh, next slide uh, is a good view characterizing uh, the rows of shade trees, which is a common characteristic of um, parkways again and also this photo is uh, the main segment segment uh, that which is one of the most intact segments of the original design uh, and again circulation is punctuated right now with rotaries that have more ornamental trees and shrubs but again the main areas are primarily shade trees and lawn if we move into the next slide uh, our, a little bit about our landscape approach uh, this, we would uh, like to maintain and 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 where we can uh, separate modes of travel uh, and provide separated rows of trees and use the open lawn character with subtle grading, uh, keep open views for safety and not blocked by shrubs or other materials and also retain existing site features such as stone walls or other historic elements. If we go to the next slide, 
uh, we would like to infill gaps within the tree line boulevard would like to assess new road and pathway alignments to preserve and protect existing trees where we can prune and repair trees that are in fair condition to improve health would like to improve soil conditions which can be a challenge uh, of balancing and introducing soil amendments without uh, disturbing existing roots and also uh, look at opportunities to improve connections to site adjacencies through uh, site furnishings, improving path alignments, or other opportunities to create pause spaces uh, within the linear context, such as um, a, a small, small uh, what we're calling design opportunities. So if we move to the next slide, it's uh, a, a couple examples of some small interventions, such as a bench, a place to stop, maybe some interpretive signage or um, wayfinding signage, maybe uh, bike parking, something that's that's small but also provides a nice site amenity. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, hand it over to Matt to speak more about the specific three options. And and these uh, the this landscape vision is uh, would be similar for all three at this point. It's really a, a, a larger overarching theme. Thanks, Rich. So there's going to be a lot of information I'm going to cover. Uh, as, as, as many have said before, we focus on developing three different alternatives uh, for consistency and nomenclature. Uh, I'm going to go through alternative A, which we have named two circles. There's an alternative B, which is one circle, and alternative C, which is no circles. Uh, it's as straightforward as it might sound. Uh, we are trying to keep two circular intersections for alternative A converting a Kelly circle into a signalized intersection for alternative B. And for alternative C, we're, we're converting both circles into two signalized intersections. And so our approach throughout the entire development of these conceptual or schematic designs is really to, to stay within the core of those shared goals and values that we went through uh, during our, our June public information meeting. Uh, everything that's been said so far is, is really the foundation of what we looked at for every single treatment, intersection, connection, uh, and how people are experiencing the corridor. As, as Jeff has often said, <clears throat> uh, we're trying to put the park back in Parkway, uh, and that's, that's really the core of, of what we're trying to do here. So in all three alternatives, uh, you'll see a focus on, uh, as Bob had mentioned, speed management. We're, we're trying to make sure that uh, the right traffic is going to the, to the right location without uh, adding any additional cut through traffic on, on local streets trying to make sure that local local traffic can, can maintain accessibility to the carriageways. And that we can build designs uh, that are based on working within the existing footprint, because we know how sensitive uh, we need to be uh, around the existing uh, trees throughout the corridor. So our intent is to, to capitalize on as much of that existing pavement as, as we can and satisfy the needs of, of all of our users, whether you're a pedestrian, cyclist uh, or motorists, <clears throat> whether you're traveling through or trying to enjoy uh, the park space. We're trying to bring back uh, the missing link uh, between Jamaica Pond and, and, and Forest Hills. So those are some common themes that you'll see throughout every alternative. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to, to, to really focus on is, is really targeted interventions at the main four areas throughout the corridor. So you have a focus on Kelly Circle, uh, another focus on the main barrel and the carriageways that connects both circles and then Murray Circle and then moving down to the Arboy and Upper Arboy. So I'm going to go through each of these individual areas and, and slide through what the existing condition looks like and then what each alternative is providing. Uh, there's a lot of information here so I'm sorry if it's going to be information overflow uh, but there will be uh, uh, plenty of opportunity uh, to, to dive, dive a little bit deeper uh, into these alternatives with both this meeting as well as uh, different ways for, for comment that Nate Lash will go into uh, after I finish. <clears throat> so similar to how Nate broke down the public feedback that we received both through uh, our social pinpoint map, through written comments, through phone calls, through our site visits, uh, we broke down the feedback for every single distinct area. So for Kelly Circle, we asked uh, we broke down those categories in the same way of what people like, safety issues, ideas, and additional comments. So people like, you know, the safety of a signalized intersection at Elliott Street. Uh, they thought that there was absolutely a speed management problem going around Kelly Circle, inconsistent design elements, uh, as well as that confusion about who has to merge where and who has to go where, whether you're coming from Jamaica Way and trying to just merge onto the road, or if you're coming from the carriageway and trying to connect into the Arbor Way. 
Uh, and so there's there's a plethora of ideas and, and really you really take heart into to how much people you know invest into into the facility and the ideas that they put out there. So uh, people suggested, can we consolidate the U-turns that are within Kelly Circle? Uh, can we enhance the pavement markings so you know who's merging where, who's, who's going where? Can we can we connect that missing link for bicycle and pedestrian accommodations uh, in this stretch? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, as well as, can we capitalize on the green space too uh, within within Kelly Circle? Uh, right now, that's it's a very large green space, and, and there's a barrier to people actually enjoying it. Uh, and exploring it. So this is the layout of the existing footprint of Kelly Circle, three lanes on, on both sides of the road. It's it's an oblong circular intersection somewhat. There's there's two U-turns in there. It has a direct connection to Jamaica Way, several side streets through the Pond Street extension, uh, and, and Francis Parkman Drive. So the first alternative where we maintain the circular flow of this intersection reduces the number of lanes that circulate around Kelly Circle from, from three lanes, so a, a pretty large cross-section, uh, down to two lanes, so we can provide uh, that north-south connection for, for pedestrians and bikes. And so just to clarify also what you'll be seeing in these alternatives is everything that's in purple is exactly what Amy said, that, that option for us to either use a separated bike lane or a shared use facility. Everything that's in that light tan or yellow will be uh, proposed sidewalks or reconstructed sidewalks. Uh, and then the green is existing or enhanced green space. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll see some Halloween themed stars, which, which cover that design opportunity that, that Rich had gotten into a little bit. Uh, as well as we wanted to highlight places where we couldn't stay within the existing footprint of the road to, to make a safe connection uh, for each user. So if there's a tree that we're anticipating will be impacted at this stage, we wanted to highlight it. So it was very clear uh, what's happening between each alternative. Uh, each of the, the lighter uh, or, or darker uh, green tree tree blocks is an existing tree, and that lighter circle is a proposed new planting for a tree. And so the maintenance of this circle uh, intends to try to, to reduce the confusion of, of, of one motorist and, and really bring back or provide that missing link uh, between all users. It provides connections between both sides of the Arbor Way, east-west, uh, as, as well as maintains all the existing connections to all of the side streets while promoting lower travel speeds. <clears throat> the next focus for Kelly Circle was to transition into a signalized intersection to try to capitalize on a green space that's within the current circle and uh, direct Park Francis Parkman Drive uh, right into a bi-directional Arbor Way that sits within primarily within the existing footprint uh, of the northbound direction of, of Kelly Circle. So you have bi-directional travel on, on one side of the roadway, and then we're also, that also allows us to provide uh, a north-south connection for pedestrians and bikes connecting to the existing Emerald Necklace paths with only a single conflict point uh, at the signalized intersection at Francis Parkman Drive. So if you're enjoying the park, you can cross the street with, with the ADA accessible uh, actuated uh, signal and then you don't have to cross any any additional traffic. This allows us to do a significant amount of infill of, of new trees, but it does impact uh, several trees uh, within the footprint. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the, the third option where we also remove the, the circle uh, provides a signalized intersection that maintains that that connection to Francis Parkman Drive because we know that there's a substantial amount of volume that goes down that dire down to that direction, uh, provides space for some of those design uh, opportunities, still provides that limited conflict uh, between pedestrians and bikes uh, and motorists, uh, and allows us to, to navigate a shared youth path or separated bike lane through the green space. And it, it maintains all connections to, to all existing streets and allows us to capitalize on the existing pavement width uh, that is on the eastern side uh, of the Arbor Way traveling north-south. So the next segment is the main barrel and the carriageways. So very similar, uh, a lot of the safety issues that, that were discussed previously, people are traveling too fast, uh, the merge between the, the northbound barrel of the carriageway and, and the, the main barrel. Uh, it's, it's dangerous to some and, uh, and, and it causes a lot of friction and, and confusion. And 
as as Amy had had, had mentioned, is that there's a lot of unsafe uh, movements for for pedestrians and bikes because there's there's not the connection there. And so some of the ideas is can we channel the the traffic to the main barrel of the arboy? Can we repurpose the focus of the carriageways for 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 local streets and and make space for uh, robust facilities for pedestrians and, and bikes? And can we limit the carriageway to local vehicle access only? As well as is, is really accentuate the historic excuse me accentuate the historic character uh, of this segment. So this is what the the corridor looks like now. As Bob had mentioned, there's four lanes, four vehicular lanes that travel both north and south. So it's a substantial amount of, of pavement width for uh, for coming in, in in two lanes and and leaving in two lanes. It has those those buffered areas that. That really segment the main barrel uh, with the carriageways and going into the alternative a uh, we maintain the the circulation so the southbound barrel maintains uh, southbound access to all the budding uh, houses uh, we really tried to to reclaim some of that space to make sure that we can provide that north south connection one of the things that you'll see that's that's possible for both this alternative and the next is that there's enough space to one maintain an 18 foot width, uh, which is uh, adequate for for emergency vehicle access and as well as the ability for people to to pull over to the road if there's an ambulance that's trying to go by them, uh, as well as bi-directional facilities for for pedestrians and bikes. Uh, that doesn't mean that that'll be the best solution. Uh, two two facilities is is additional conflict areas, additional impervious surface area and we're trying to balance out all the needs for the corridor. So the focus on this area, as, as has been said, is, is to really to slow down traffic and to provide that connection uh, in where there's a huge gap, as well as to, to infill some of those gaps of trees that have been impacted by urban hazards, uh, underground utility impacts, uh, and salt spray and, and things that we experience uh, up here in New England. Primarily, the footprint of what we're proposing is, is staying within the footprint of the existing uh, pavement width. Getting into the next alternative for alternative B really allows us to, to maintain that, that bi-directional travel in the main barrel uh, up to the signalized intersection at Kelly Circle. You're still seeing a single lane of travel in both directions on the, the carriageway southbound. Uh, and it allows us to, to slow vehicles down as we're having a, similar to the last alternative, a, a, a race crossing that allows people to actually activate and use those buffers safely. People already use them to walk their dogs uh, and use that space uh, for their pleasure. And so we're, we're trying to provide them safe accessibility uh, to that space instead of trying to hop across two lanes of, of potentially high-speed traffic. Different from this alternative from the previous, is that there's also a mid-block signalized crossing that allows you to go from one neighborhood to the next. So it, it provides a ADA accessible uh, signal to, to make that connection where there is no connection uh, in that area today. As you can see, the connection from Francis Parkman Drive uh, as well as the Arbor Way main barrel uh, is provided to, to both sides of the carriageway for, for local access. So really trying to funnel that traffic into the main barrel uh, of the corridor. So the third alternative, alternative C, is, is one of the biggest changes that, that we see within this area. So instead of reducing the number of lanes to a single lane in each direction, uh, we try to, to, to set this up for a shared facility. So you'll see a lot of different changes in geometry. So there's a lot of chicanes that that are intended to really slow down traffic to something where if you're a pedestrian or a bike, you can travel on both directions and feel safe when a motorist can only go uh, 10 or less miles per hour due to the decrease of speeds. So we're trying to totally change uh, the context of that area in this alternative to provide a safe space and still provide that north-south connection from Kelly Circle all the way down to, to Murray Circle. So next up, we're gonna move right into Murray Circle. So Murray Circle has a lot going on. Uh, as you've heard previously, it's an existing uh, 
the, the pavement markings have, have worn out uh, long ago, and so it, it encourages high vehicle speeds. Uh, still a lot of confusion, a general sense of, of chaos because people are crossing each other, cutting people off, uh, trying to go as fast as they possibly can. So there's a lot of dangerous interactions between pedestrians, bikes, uh, and motorists. Uh, there's no north-south connection along the eastern portion of Murray Circle if you're a pedestrian. And so it's challenging to find your way from, from the upper Arbor Way uh, or if you're traveling from the Arboretum and trying to get into the eastern uh, neighborhoods uh, across the street over there. Uh, there's some general concern uh, between the Prince Street and Center Street signalized intersection east of the circle. People running red lights, uh, people having uh, just not complying with, with the, the, the flow of traffic at that location. So our goal is to really try to, to really direct people, like Bob was saying, to streamline the flow of traffic into areas where people can feel safe again. So our goal uh, and some of the ideas that we've heard is, is to add more pavement markings. So to consider transitioning this location into more of a modern roundabout feel, which will provide substantial safety benefits for this area. And make, <clears throat> excuse me, the green space within Murray Circle, some people have said, can we make that accessible for pedestrians? It's, it's a very large green space and, and it's unusable because of the, the high speeds of traffic uh, and just how it's situated. And just overall, make those connections that are missing for, for cyclists uh, robust and, and safe so that you can feel safe no matter what alternative uh, is proposed. So this is the existing footprint of, of, of Murray Circle. It's a very large pavement area, very large diameter uh, existing rotary. Uh, the northbound direction of the Arboway is directed right into the northbound carriageway, connecting right into to Center Street. You have the upper Arboway that sits since it's above the Arbor Way, uh, between those two facilities, you have uh, a fence that I'll talk about a little bit later that has been you know, crashed through a couple of times, but uh, still maintaining a focus on Murray Circle. We know that there's a high volume of, of vehicles coming from Center Street, the Upper Arbor Way, uh, as well as coming from downtown, going into the intersection, uh, focusing, depending on what peak hour you're in, there's, there's a high volume of traffic that you need to navigate safely uh, throughout this area. So one thing to, to note in this, this first alternative is, is that we're really focusing on working within the existing footprint, paved footprint of the rotary. So we're trying to shrink down the existing center island and the overall width of the circular intersection so it can act as more of a modern roundabout. So we want to slow vehicle speeds down, uh, process traffic through steadily, as Bob had mentioned, and not just through you know, platooning or whoever can get there the fastest, the first, uh, and really make sure that once you're getting to the intersection or leaving the intersection, that you don't need to change lanes while you're in there and that you have clear visibility if somebody is trying to cross the street. And for any multi-lane roundabout, our focus is to, to provide <clears throat> some type of uh, signalized crossing element to, to really uh, encourage compliance uh, to allow that safe crossing to happen. This, this intersection uh, has, has a whole bunch of connections into it. So one of the, one of the challenges is to make sure that it, it's, it's very clear on, on where you need to go, whether you're a pedestrian, cyclist, or, or motorist. Uh, one of the elements that we're providing here to manage some of the peak hour traffic going from the southbound on the Arboy, going to Center Street, which is to the bottom of the screen, uh, is to, to suggest providing a slip lane. And so we know that sometimes slip lanes uh, encourage people to, to go to a high rate of speed. So this one would be designed with uh, a race crossing element uh, to, to encourage enhanced visibility for pedestrians or cyclists trying to cross that slip lane, uh, as well as a geometry that maintains the 25 or less miles per hour that we're encouraging people to navigate through this multi-lane roundabout. And so, so really all the purple that you see uh, is, is really to make sure that we have connected connectivity throughout all the legs of, of this intersection. The second alternative where we still maintain the circular intersection but focus still on a modern roundabout approach uh, reduces the number of lanes on, on a couple of the legs. <clears throat> Excuse me, still maintains that 
uh, that direct access to all the different neighborhood streets if you're a pedestrian cyclist or if you're a motorist and we were attempting to do this safely uh, so if you're leaving the arboy continue to go southbound one of the significant changes here is that we've reduced the number of lanes from from two lanes down to one to encourage a shorter crossing distances slower speed and then just overall managing the traffic uh, with the amount of volume that we have with the amount of facilities that we believe that we need uh, continuing to go southbound again uh, similar to the previous alternative you'll see any trees that are in red there will be trees that are proposed to be impacted absolutely because they'll be in the footprint uh, of the existing roadway so the last alternative which focuses on converting murray circle into a signalized intersection really changes the feel uh, of this of this intersection primarily to accommodate the peak hour traffic you'll see uh, three lanes on the approach going northbound uh, as well as three lanes on the approach coming from center street going eastbound you'll see two slip lanes that are meant to to encourage slower speeds just like you saw on the first alternative for the the roundabout you'll have a race race device to encourage slower speeds for uh, for vehicles uh, or it'll be uh, fully signalized just like the rest of the intersection to make sure that we're maintaining that compliance so everyone can feel safe uh, as they're navigating through this intersection still maintaining all the different movements that exist today such as may street uh, instead of branching out into center street as its own uh, additional lane that that suddenly dies <laughs> once you get to uh, the next signalized intersection we're branching it to a perpendicular crossing to just enhance visibility and to encourage uh, slower speeds so that uh, if you're a pedestrian or, or a bike uh, your level of safety is balanced with with motorists as well one of the things that you have seen in, in the past two alternatives as well as this is trying to capitalize on the green space that's available by reconfiguring this intersection so that green space that used to be at the center of the circle we're trying to relocate it as usable green space and still trying to infill all those gaps that have missing trees or if we're regaining green space to really <clears throat> enhance uh, the arborway as a tree-lined corridor so branching off to the last segment south of murray circle and then we'll talk a little bit about the upper arborway as well so very similar again high vehicle speeds there's some vehicles that are parked you know along a southbound shoulder that's not very wide for parked vehicles uh, because the the arboretum is such a, a great amenity is that people want to go there so we need to figure out a way where people can uh, use that space safely uh, and, and 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 allow it to be used by all different users no matter if you're a pedestrian cyclist or, or motorist people have seen a higher volume of trucks than uh, than, than, than they think is appropriate. So they want to install no trucks, uh, a no truck sign, which there is a small sign, but that doesn't mean that there couldn't be something that's more prominent to really make sure that this, this parkway is, is more focused on uh, you know, smaller, smaller size vehicles. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as Amy had talked a little bit earlier about that missing connection that's within the, the main barrel and the carriageways, uh, People also wanted to see more of a robust connection uh, going all the way down to Forest Hills. There's uh, really nice uh, connections over at the Casey Arboy project. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we are uh, at least getting up to the standard of what's what's being provided there uh, with the, it, as long as we can work within the existing footprint of the roadway uh, and, uh, and really be sensitive to the context that we're working with them. So on the upper Arboy, uh, <clears throat> still some challenges with with speeding especially at st rose street and visibility if you're a pedestrian or a cyclist <clears throat> excuse me uh, people also wanted to see enhanced safety measures at the the arboretum crosswalk there's been a couple of instances where where there's been crashes and, and people have been hit even though there have been safety improvements and we're, we would do our best to, to enhance one the lighting uh, and, and really uh, make the chicane that slows people down as robust as we can uh, and, and among there's potentially other opportunities there to, to really improve that safety. We want to update people that have asked to, to make sure that it's it's very clear, you know, whether you're a pedestrian or a bike, that you can walk through that area or ride through that area safely. So we'd be looking to 
to upgrade uh, those connections, including pavement markings, as much as is feasible. So first, we're going to look at the Arboretum section, so south of Murray Circle, for both of these areas. <clears throat> the existing cross section is, is a four-lane roadway, two lanes in each direction, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with access to the Arboretum, and on the upper way, upper arbor way, a single lane in each direction, uh, sidewalk lining the northbound side with the, with the tree line buffer. So the first alternative maintains that four lane cross section all the way up to the Arboretum driveway, where it starts to reduce down to a three lane cross section. So we maintain the footprint of the existing median, uh, but then reallocate some of that space uh, for a, a fully connected north south uh, pedestrian or uh, shared use path or a separated bike lane. So in all of these instances, when we say a separated facility for a shared use path or a separated uh, bike lane, we're looking at a, a, a an actual grade separated facility. We're not looking at uh, just pavement markings uh, in a buffer. So on the upper arbor way, we're, we're still maintaining that chicane, but making it actual fully physical. So instead of just pavement markings, uh, we're trying to, to actually relocate the curve to really encourage that speed management approach. Uh, and then also really trying to put a focus on what the geometry looks like coming into that, that crosswalk. So in a couple of the different alternatives, you'll see the crosswalk location a little bit differently. And our focus is to define the location which provides the, the highest level of visibility, whether you're traveling southbound or northbound, uh, and encourages that crossing to happen uh, as safe as possible. So this next alternative that, that rolls into the, the one circle, <coughs> excuse me, relocates the uh, the driveway south, excuse, relocates the crossing south of the Arboretum driveway. This uh, approach for the cross section leaves the roundabout, the modern roundabout, with a three lane cross section, one lane leaving, uh, two lanes going in. And then once you hit the Arboretum driveway, it reduces down to a single lane in each direction which will be median separated. This allows us to really capitalize, again, on reclaiming some of that green space, as well as uh, reclaiming some of that space for fully connected uh, pedestrian and bike facilities. The last alternative where we're coming from a signalized intersection uh, has an approach of the, the four lane cross section, but instead of separating the northbound north and southbound directions with the median, we would separate it with a double yellow line. So there's there's definitely enough space uh, to be able to provide both directions of travel within that existing um, that ex existing barrel, uh, but it gives us the opportunity to really reallocate all of that southbound space for a really robust shared facility, which creates additional uh, added trees for the tree line corridor, as you'll see throughout the the alternatives. Uh, both on this. Uh, approach as well as a previous. Uh, we're also trying to manage how people are crossing the street on the upper arbor way. So you'll see some of the intersections as, as raised crossings to try to limit the up and down and to make sure that we have enough room for ADA accessible ramps as you're crossing some of those side streets. Some of the, the space that we have is tight and so raising the elevation of that crossing not only slows vehicular traffic down, it also makes it more of a streamlined connection for users. So getting to the, the last section of the corridor, the last bend of the, of the arbor way where people are uh, able to start accelerating and in some cases getting into the, the corridor space. Uh, the existing condition is, is still the two lanes in each direction. And then for the alternative A, we really see how that cross section of, of three lanes uh, develops further down as we get into the, uh, to the Forest Hills area to the southern end of our project limits. So still median separated, maintaining two lanes of travel in the northbound direction, uh, providing that southbound connection, uh, excuse me, bi-directional connection for pedestrians and bikes and merging into the existing sidewalk, which would be repurposed for a shared use path to provide that continuous facility. Uh, our goal here and everywhere along the corridor is to minimize our impact to existing trees. And so we're focusing on working within the existing paved footprint and, and threading the needle uh, as much as we can. This location on the upper arbor way, you'll see that, that connection and that treatment that we're trying to do to, to 
the slow vehicle speeds as they're coming down the hill. Uh, and so that's raising the intersection at St. Rose and the Upper Arbor Way to, to an acceptable level uh, that, that doesn't make people feel unsafe as you're going down the Upper Arbor Way, but also is, is visible enough so that they'll know uh, that there is, there's a raised device in front of them and that they need to manage their speed so that everyone who's using that, that facility can be safe. The next alternative going into one circle is that is that median separated corridor, a single line in each direction, allows us to, to regain some of that green space, both on the northbound side, uh, as well as on the southbound side, reallocate some of that space for a separated facility. Similar treatments on the upper arbor way to, to raise the intersection uh, and to really uh, make that a, a different contextual feel uh, for everyone who's, who's using that segment of the corridor. So the last piece is just an extension of when we're providing uh, both directions of travel uh, on just a single barrel, but then we're tapering back into the existing uh, into a median separated corridor so we can get into the Forest Hills area of the project. So there's been a lot that I've talked about and, and hopefully you stuck with me. There's a lot of detail here. And, and after uh, we finish up this presentation, there's, there's, there's plenty of spaces where you can ask us, us questions as well as go on our social pinpoint site uh, to really get into the nitty gritty of each of those areas. But it helps us because uh, we're focusing on getting as, as much distinct comments on each of those areas. And we really wanted to, to say that there's some interchangeable parts there. So it doesn't mean that just because something's in alternative A doesn't mean that that treatment can't carry over into alternative B. So there's there's some interchangeability. So we want to know what your distinct comments are for, for each area of the corridor. So in terms of where we're at and where we're going, so you've gotten all the way up uh, to, to fall of 2020. Here's where we are. And we're sharing the conceptual designs and trying to get as much feedback from, from you all who knew the corridor better than we do. Uh, and then we're, we're progressing towards, uh, once, we, once we get that feedback and, and we progress towards a preferred alternative, that's when we'll start getting into the design development stage and then come back to get an additional uh, gauge on, on how we're doing and, and, and how those treatments have, have converted into actual uh, engineering drawings and engineering designs. So our plan is, has been always to try to do a, an aggressive schedule. And so originally we've, we've pointed out that the intent is to start construction in 2021. Uh, but due to some of the public feedback that we got of, of such a substantial issue of some of the utilities uh, that are degrading uh, underground, we're working with, with private utility companies now and trying to make sure that once we're finished with this project, people aren't cutting up the road <laughs> with, with a brand new facility that, uh, that it's spent a lot of time and a lot of public feedback has went into it. So next up, I'm gonna transition uh, back to Nate Lash and he's gonna get into a little bit more detail on how you can provide comment uh, because we know that there's so many attendees here and we really wanna get as much feedback as we can. So Nate, over to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, I know that was a lot of information um, and we recognize that you know this isn't just one intersection we're looking at, we're, we're looking at the entire corridor um, and with three different alternatives, um, each with different elements at each location, um, we just recognize that that's a lot of information to take in. And, and so, um, you know, we, we have a more than two week comment period um, that we'll be accepting, accepting comments um, through Friday, December 6th. Um, and you can ask your questions and, and share your feedback with us tonight. Uh, we also have three other ways of, of um, gathering public input. So the first is um, using our interactive online map. Um, so Matt, I'll ask you if you can make me the presenter. Um, hopefully, if you engaged with us um, in, in June and July, uh, this is familiar to you, but for those who did not, um, I'm just gonna sort of walk you through um, how to use the Social Pinpoint site uh, to place your comments um, directly on, on the plans and on the map. And so this, um, the, the link to this page is, uh, is on DCR's project webpage, um, and um, it'll direct you to this, uh, the map where it has uh, instructions on the left-hand side of, of how to use the tool. Um, there's a number of tabs also on the left. So we added 
you know, sort of the highlighted uh, themes of public input that we gathered in June and July um, that we walked through today as well. Um, you know, if, if you're really interested, you can click here and view the entire um, set of comments that, that were submitted. Uh, we also listed out the common features that Matt went over. So the things that we're trying to do with each one of these alternatives. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in on Murray Circle because that, that's definitely one of the most recognizable areas in the project and, and somewhere where we got a lot of comments about. So you hear there's Murray Circle in the, in the center of your screen. When, when I click on Alternative A, um, you'll see the plan, the illustration overlaid on the aerial for, for Murray Circle. And you can scroll up and, and, and scroll down, um, zoom in and out to, to see that um, in Alternative A. If there's something you like about um, what you're seeing on the screen, you can drag the, the something you like. Um, if you like the raised crossing in that bypass, you can uh, fill out that comment there, um, hit submit. And, and then a little pin will appear there. If there's something you would change about the alternative, you would do the same thing, but, but with a little wrench. Um, and one of the cool things about this tool is you can also you know, toggle between the different alternatives to see exactly what is being proposed at each area to compare and contrast um, how each, each plan um, changes the roadway and, and repurposes space in different areas. Um, also, on the left-hand side, um, we wrote out descriptions about sort of the key features um, and, and things that, um, that we're trying to accomplish for each of these alternatives. Um, and again, we, we know it's a complex project with a lot going on, and so we tried to make it um, as easy as, as possible to, to um, go through the different changes and to see what's happening in each location. Um, and, you know, if uh, we, we got about 400 comments last time we did this in, in the summer, um, and, and we're looking for uh, another sort of robust round, round of input for these alternatives. Matt, I just sent you the presenter request. If you can actually go back one slide, um, I'll just finish up. The other ways to, to submit public input, if, if you have comments, but you'd rather not use it on the map um, and want it a little simpler, you can definitely submit a written comment online and submit it through DCR's public online comment portal. Uh, that link is listed here. Uh, you can also send some comments by postal mail. We got a few letters in, in the summer um, and, and scan them in. And so we'll definitely accept comments that way as well. I'm going to go next. Um, as Jeff mentioned, you know we're we're not in person. This is maybe some of your uh, first virtual public meetings for some folks. Um, so wanted to give some brief instructions about um, what is um, uh, you know sort of the tools and, and how to engage in, in the next hour or so. So I know we announced, you know, the meeting would go till eight, but I think given how long the presentation took and how many folks are still on, on the meeting, we got 140 folks here. So um, I think we'll be taking comments a little past eight, probably through 8.30. Um, if, if we have called on you and you, you've, you've raised your hand, um, you, that little mic icon needs to be green. Um, so the mic needs to be muted, uh, unmuted on your end as well as on our end. Um, if you would like to speak, um, you, can, you can click the little raise hand button. Um, and then you can also submit your comments or questions using the question box. So we've already got a queue of questions that, that folks have submitted. Um, so appreciate that. Um, and then if you just go to the next slide, Matt. Um, I'll just echo what Jeff said at the beginning that, you know, we are very much at the conceptual level still. Um, these are not engineering drawings, and there are some very big trade-offs between each of the alternatives uh, being proposed. Um, and we, what would be most helpful for us is sort of your, your, um, your big picture comment. So, you know, what about the alternatives do you really love? What about the alternatives is unacceptable? Um, you know, what do you see that you don't love but you could live with? Um, and again, you know, thank you for your patience. This is, um, 
as Jeff mentioned, we're, we're not able to read the room as if we were, as if we could in a regular room, um, but we're gonna do our best to go back and forth between folks who have raised their hand and folks who have submitted their questions um, in, in the questions box. Um, and with so many folks, we want to ask to be efficient with your time. Um, if you are given the opportunity to, to speak, um, you know, it, tonight is about the design alternatives, not the short-term improvements. Um, and it's a little too early to get excited about all the details of exactly what trees are going to be planted where. Um, we're really looking for so, those big picture reactions. Um, and again, if uh, you're having technical difficulties or if um, you want a, a week or two to, to digest those comments, um, please feel free to do that and then submit your comments. Um, I believe there was a typo on the previous slide. So that, that comment deadline is going to be November 6th. Nate, I'll pass it over to you to get started. All right, so um, I want to thank uh, Jenny, who uh, kicked over to us that thus far we have no elected officials uh, or their staff members who are looking to speak. Is that still true, Jenny? It, it is still true. Um, if you would like to speak, please um, chat me, and we will make sure that you get a chance. All right, so um, throughout this, uh, Nate Lash and I have been trying to answer some of the clarifying questions as we go. Um, we have a few hands up. NL, do you want to get to some of the questions that you and I uh, chose to defer for when the whole technical team was available? And then we'll try some hands. Sure, yeah, I'll go to the, uh, the first question we received. Um, Matt, so maybe if you want to go to alternative C um, on the very southern end of the, uh, um, the plan there you go so the question is for alternative c why is that the only option of the three to indicate the shared use path continuing all the way down to the forest hill road gate so it'll be one more yeah there we go yeah so i'll, I'll answer that so so I think all, all three of the options, I think that's, that's just a color area error. Uh, the intent is to make sure that there's not that gap uh, between any of the options. Uh, that existing space is, is, is anywhere between an, an eight to 10 foot sidewalk. So it can accommodate uh, shared use, especially within that constrained condition uh, once we go all the way up to our, our southern limits. So, so I would consider any of the alternatives uh, able to provide that shared facility uh, to the full southern extent of the project. So sorry for that. Uh, uh, that uh, miss misnomer. Uh, you want to do another one, NL? Um, sure. I'll say maybe one more text, and then we'll go over the hands. Um, and this is a question that I, I think we've gotten in a, in a few different variations already in the text, and that's. Um, you know, uh, sort of about the degree to which some of these elements are interchangeable between the alternatives. Um, so there's a, a question here. Personally, I think alternative A can be dropped. If there was consensus on alternative C, but people want to keep a rotary at Murray Circle, would it be possible to do that while keeping the rest of alternative C? So Nate, I'll take that one if I could. Uh, I, I would say emphatically yes. So we were at the, as we said in the beginning, we're at the very early conceptual stage. So we have assembled each of the alternatives here in a way that we think the design team makes sense. But what we're going to find as we go through the comment period is that we're going to have variations on each of these. And we may take an, an element from one that people like and then fit it into another. So absolutely. And that's why I said at the opening. If there are things that you like in a particular section on one of these, let us know and we can pick it up and we can move it to another alternative and so on. So I don't, what I don't anticipate happening is that we'll all gravitate to the same alternative in its entirety. That almost never happens. So please tell us as much as you can about what you like about each of these and what you don't like and be specific about the location you're talking about. The more we know from you about, about what your interests are and using a social pinpoint, the, better, the easier it will be for us design team to get closer to that preferred alternative. 
All right, great answer, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to start off um, with uh, Adrian Randolph. Uh, Adrian, uh, your microphone is in your hands. Go for it. Thank you. Um, could you put up the picture for Alternative B Kelly Circle, if you can? Um, so I live on um, on Pond Street. Uh, I mean, I live on Furnival Road that goes into Pond Street, um, right um, where Pond Street going up Pond Street on Furnival Road. Um, so what I see here is that you've closed off Pond Street to be able to get off to the left. And um, I know the whole thing of this is safety, but for all these people who live up in Jamaica Hill and Moss Hill, this is our only way out except for two residential streets. One is Rockwood Street that goes right into this park school at the end where people park and kids and everything and are going out in the morning. The second one is my street, Furnival Road, that goes into Parkman Drive and then to the back part of Lars Anderson. There's a lot of children playing on my street as well as people walking to um, Lars Anderson. So if it's for safety, you just created two big safety problems if you cut off our exit. That's our only exit. We're trapped up here. If you drive up here, you can see these. that's the only way out of this area is Pond Street. So then we'd have to go out, go all the way down to Murray Circle, and then go all the way to make a U-turn to get back up um, that way. So that is, to me, um, is going to create very big problems. But maybe I'm misunderstanding that you would close off the main, the only exit out of Moss Hill and Jamaica Hills. Hey, I understand the question. And so what, what it's hard to see at the scale, but at the bottom of Pond Street, you can turn left. That section between Pond Street and Francis Parkman Drive on this concept is two way. So you can turn oh, left. Oh, okay. The Thank you. That's not yeah. clear. Okay. Well, yeah, that's really see. helpful. Okay. <laughs> then that wouldn't, I guess, be a problem. Although I will say that there is a huge amount of traffic on Pond Street because it's the only way out from South Brookline, too. So just to make sure that things can bear the burden of the amount of traffic. All right, thanks for clarifying that. Thank you, Adrian. All right, so our next hand here is um, Alexander Frieden. And I would just ask folks, um, when you get done uh, with your comment, just pull your hand back down again so I can keep track of who we've called on. Thank you, Adrian, perfect. Go ahead, Alexander, you're up. Hi, right, thanks again. Um, this is a great presentation. One question I have is I end up like, um, well, so for a number of designs, you're trying to incentivize people to bike and walk, which is kind of in your mission statement, which is to incentivize um, uh, recreation and in, in during the in Massachusetts parks. Um, I a lot of four lane uh, streets here, which kind of is runs counter to your intended goal. I Generally, I've seen studies, including by Jeff Speck, that you can do the same with three lanes in across the whole thing here, which I think would increase your parkway here. And I really hadn't seen any of your designs, um, but in general, you know, I think that uh, and and uh, well, in previous comments you had, which is too many lanes in a number of these sections, uh, is against the character of this these particular parklands. So I guess I'd like to see less lanes, more parkland in a lot of these. Thanks. Yeah, and great question. So, so that's been that's been one of the core goals that we're trying to accomplish in, in most of these alternatives, is work within the existing curb to curb width, uh, and and any excess pavement that we can uh, recapitalize on for for bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Uh, let's let's do it. Uh, let's try to limit our impact to, to trees, but also provide comfortable and, and safe facilities that can connect you all the way from the pond, all the way down to uh, Forest Hills. So, especially once we get south of Murray Circle, uh, that, that's one of the things that we're considering is, you know, is trying to make sure that we're providing the necessary number of lanes uh, while trying to balance out uh, our mode use so everyone can feel safe. So, great question. Thank you. And Al, you want to do a few more of the text for us? Sure. So the first question um, 
for this round is why hasn't a traffic uh, why hasn't a new traffic study been conducted before these changes have been proposed? Fifteen years is a long time, especially when major infrastructure in Forest Hills has changed since then. Um, and then another one related to traffic in the Murray Circle redesigns, not the elimination. Won't the signalized crosswalks back up traffic to the circle? Yeah, so I'll, I'll let Bob go into a little bit about uh, just the, the basis of, uh, of some of the data that we're that we're using. But but big picture too, especially the focus here is is meeting those those shared goals and values of trying to make sure that we're providing a corridor that meets DCR's mission statement, which which works for everybody and, and safe for everyone to get around, uh, and to still move that traffic uh, steadily steadily along uh, in. And as you saw in each of these areas, one of the biggest concerns that people had was was speeding, right? So to, to manage speeding and to encourage uh, safe connections, uh, we're trying to provide you know a, a redesign which which balances the, the use of the corridor. But thank you for that question. And thanks, thanks, uh, Matt, for adding that. That's uh, definitely what we're looking to do at a lot of these uh, crossings especially since we've seen many, uh, many crash reports recently uh, of just uh, pedestrians and cyclists, um, especially on Murray Circle and uh, through other uh, uh, crossings across Arbor Way in this uh, project area, they've been hit on the road by vehicles traveling through here, uh, either be it uh, off uh, peak hours where people are speeding or even uh, during the busy times as people are just trying to uh, uh, to, to get out of uh, to get out of the Arbor Way and just get to their connections, which is understandable. But at the same time, we cannot just be hitting uh, pedestrians or cyclists. We need to keep them safe. And we need to provide uh, those crossings or make them safer at least than they are today. Um, so, uh, Nate, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that at the beginning of the question was more for a traffic study to if a newer traffic study had been done uh, recently. Um, yeah. If we were trying to go, to go towards again traffic uh, volumes, we hadn't done much. Uh, we haven't done um, newer accounts just because we fell into COVID times. Uh, but we were able to use um, uh, the past studies volumes and just uh, work with those to see what's the growth been in the area since um, the the last time some of the accounts were done over here and try to increase them to the year that we're working in 2020, uh, because at least up to that point, for some of the roadways, there seemed to be some increase. Other roadways seem to be a little bit of a decrease. We try to be conservative and uh, get a good number to um, you know, increase a little bit those uh, volumes to uh, hopefully present as best as we can year to 2020, and then just go off of what we hear in the background, more developments going on um, uh, around this area. Uh, just and just the community traffic that goes through here, if there's going to be growth in population, for example, we need to take that into account. So there was, um, we, we basically were conservative and tried to think of maybe there's a little bit more traffic that will be going through this area in the future. Though, again, with uh, COVID-19 going on, uh, that's not 100% uh, true, but we need we needed to be conservative to make sure that if there will actually be an increase in traffic, we're looking into that as well. So we did do our own due diligence and, and uh, put together a, a report and with the analysis uh, of these alternatives uh, that DCR has. Uh, but uh, actual traffic counts, for, for us to do actual traffic counts, we just didn't have the opportunity due to COVID-19. Very comprehensive answer. So the next hand we have up is from um, Ann Lusk. So um, Ann, you are unmuted. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased that the I-90 project has a separated pedestrian corridor and a separated bike corridor. We now have e-bikes. We have micro-mobility conveyances. We have accessible conveyances. They go fast. And pedestrians might be wearing earbuds and not hear a bicyclist approaching from behind. So it's very important that we not have shared use paths. Second. Please remember that the bicyclists, in addition to the pedestrians, do not prefer to bike right beside the car traffic. Though many of the early bicyclists in the U.S. were vehicular bicyclists and they wanted to ride with the cars and they thought they were really a 
car, operating their bicycle as a vehicle. The many bicyclists we want to have on this route would prefer to ride near the trees and near pedestrians. Third, make sure that you have trees near the bicyclist because it's just going to get hotter as time goes on with climate change. And also have direct lighting over the pedestrian and the bicycle corridor. Maybe catenary lights, those are old fashioned lights that are directed directly over the pedestrian and pedestrian and bike walkway. It would even be quite attractive to be a car driver and look over and to see that lighted corridor with these lights similar to lights that you put up over a piazza and make sure that it, the green in the middle of the driving area is not for the car drivers because there's this wide swath of greenery that benefits the car drivers, but then there's minimal greenery that is around the bicyclists. And finally, I'm just worried the roundabouts are really the two big old fashioned multi-lane roundabouts and the speed of the car drivers navigating around the large roundabout is just too fast that when they enter or exit the roundabout, there are gonna be conflicts with the pedestrians and the bicyclists trying to cross. And that's been a constant debate that we have had with the roundabouts. They have to be much smaller, simpler to the Australian roundabout. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly, Ann. And remember, folks, just put your hands down when you're done so that I, I can keep track. Next text question, Ann so I just wanna just wanna just cover one thing that was that was brought up there that I might not have gone into as much detail as I should have. One of the amenities that we're looking to do across this corridor is is upgrade the lighting for both pedestrians, uh, cyclists, as well as the roadway. So we're trying to make sure that it's context appropriate, that it that it ties in and mixes in with what's happening to the south as well as to the north, and it's appropriate for the neighborhood areas. Uh, so we absolutely recognize the the safety benefits of enhanced lighting as well as separation between modes. Uh, as and having a tree line corridor. So, so thank you for those those comments and questions. Nice, man. Thank you. NL. Yep. Um, these are sort of two general project questions. One is, are there typical cross sections for each of the segments just presented? And the second is, what is the time frame for completion of the project from now until project completion, and how will this project be funded? Yeah, so the, for the first for the first point is is other typical cross section it, cross sections is is yes so there's there's a typical cross section for each to make sure that we're allocating the space to the right area and to make sure that we're staying within the existing footprint of the roadway. Uh, so currently the uh, the easiest way to present it uh, on the screen over here is is top down view for us to be able to flow through each of them, but that can be provided in, you know at a later date. Absolutely. So the, the time frame um, went through that towards the end of, of where are we going from here? And so the intent from, from this stage is that we're at the conceptual level uh, is to really come to a point where we can get uh, a preferred alternative. So we get feedback for, for all of these different areas and all these different sections and we develop a cohesive design that we can bring to the design development phase. Uh, and then ideally, uh, initiate construction on, on as, as, as much of this corridor as we can uh, as soon as possible uh, while coordinating with, with all the other uh, uh, connecting elements such as making sure that private utility work is happening to enable the construction work that we're trying to do, uh, that the utility, excuse me, that the, the permits that need to be gathered, uh, especially with you know water resources are, are appropriately gathered so that there's no, there's no delays when we actually do get shovels in the ground. So ideally we're looking at, at next year, but we wanna make sure that we do our due diligence uh, for all the different components of this project. Great question. And, yeah, and uh, one more, uh, uh, the last question asked was on funding. So this project, I, I plan on funding with the DCR capital plan, um, but uh, beyond that, since we don't know yet what we're building, I can't tell you how much it's going to cost and then I don't know uh, because I don't know how much it will cost and how much we need. I don't know exactly how many, uh, how exactly we'll program the funding. So the, the closer we get to a to a preferred alternative, and as I mentioned at the beginning, that starts tonight, 
the, the faster we get to a preferred alternative, the faster I can give you answers to those sorts of questions that relate more towards the end of the design uh, period. All right, next hand belongs to famous Clay Harper. Uh, hi, um, the, uh, my main question had to do with the um, interchangeability of elements of the, the plants, and I think you already addressed most of that. Um, I just wanna say thanks for all the hard work you've done and how hard you've tried to um, bring the park back into this parkway. Um, and I'm particularly grateful for uh, on the southerly end, how you've um, uh, proposed putting a uh, raised crosswalk at St. Rose. Um, I, it, it's one of my longtime bugaboos there is that gravity propelling people down the hill has made the Honeywell crosswalk on the carriage road um, particularly unsafe. That, that lower curve there is kind of a blind curve as gravity propels you down the hill. And um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that a you know, raised table of some kind at uh, St. Rose could help tamp some of that down. So thank you for that. Thank you, Clay, much appreciated. All righty, um, I've got two questions about the Upper Arbor Way. Um, and these are uh, about you know, is there a bike lane on the Upper Arbor Way, and is there parking, and what's the parking plan um, for both the Upper Way, Upper Arbor Way, as well as the carriage roads? Great question. So, so again, this is Matt Jasmine, uh, and so we're trying to focus the Upper Arbor Way. Excuse me to maintain the the context that it is today, but to encourage slower speeds as well as accessibility for everyone. So within the current conceptual designs, we retain uh, parking along the the western side uh, and provide uh, shared use arrows, so arrows uh, along the the full extent of the roadway, so that cyclists can uh, can navigate through this road uh, while it's under slower speeds for for motorists too. So so trying to to limit any impact to parking along any of the different alternatives for the upper arbor way while providing safe connections to any of the proposed shared use paths or separated bike lanes crossing into and through Murray Circle as well as adjacent to the Arboretum. So getting on to the main barrel on the carriageways, uh, the intent is to is to provide enough space for, for safe access for all users and to provide a separated facility for, for cyclists as well as pedestrians. Uh, the intent here uh, is, is not to add any additional parking uh, along this stretch uh, to make sure that we can provide uh, accessibility for emergency vehicles uh, as they're getting into the neighborhood streets. All right, great. So the next hand we have up is from Emily Jacobson. Emily, you're good to go. Your microphone is green. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, fantastic uh, plans. I'm just looking at some of them for the first time. And I have a couple comments. Um, the first one is that at the end near Kelly Circle, I really like the alternatives that no longer have the circle in them. Um, I think it will make the area a lot more into a parkland type area and I think it will increase safety because uh, having driven through that circle a number of times and having uh, attempted to cycle through there it's um, uh, kind of a scary area. The other thing that I really like is that there is a crosswalk on Center Street. Um, I, I guess it's Center Street just as it's going into what is currently um, the circle. At, at the moment, there's sort of a fun, it's sort of a funny intersection where there's like nowhere to cross except down at the circle. And so it's great that there's a crosswalk there. I hope it's going to be a signalized crosswalk. Um, and the next thing is I have a question about um, alternative number three, 
Um, you're showing a, sort of a brick pattern on carriageways. Um, is is that a shared street or it, what? It, what is that exactly? Yeah, that's yeah, correct. That's correct. That's a so, shared so, street. Yeah, yeah. The material is identified as material mark. Mark differentiate that street. Okay, thank you very much. And if I can answer the question for the crosswalks on Center Street done by Murray, when we were looking at those crosswalks, we were looking also at the feasibility of uh, trying to signalize in order to make those uh, crossings safer uh, for pets and bikes. So um, that's definitely something we were looking into doing, uh, depending on the alternative. All right, and Al, you, you ready with your next one? I am. Uh, Matt, if you want to start heading up the corridor to Kelly. Um, <clears throat> the question is, can you please clarify how cars on Prince Street that runs parallel to Parkman Drive can cross over the Jamaica Way to the North Pound side? Yeah, so this is, excuse me, this is Matt Jasmine. So depending on which alternative you're in, so say it's alternative C where it's a signalized intersection down at Pond, uh, you're you're able to, to merge into the same traffic that's coming from Francis Parkman Drive, able to make the left at the signal and then to continue on north. Uh, some of the refinements that we can do with, with this intersection as well is to, to bring it within the intersection of Francis Parkman Drive and the extension to Prince Street to also provide that direct connection. Uh, currently, it, it provides a connection right into the local street network, which allows you to, to merge into the main barrel and to, to circle around uh, into the uh, Murray Circle. But there's nothing, uh, not much right now besides just uh, ensuring that the signal operates efficiently to, to ensure that we can mix that traffic uh, into that extension. So good question and thank you for that. All right. Next up uh, on the hands is uh, Jacqueline Youngblood. Jacqueline, your microphone is live. Jacqueline, your uh, your microphone is green. You should be good to speak if if you're trying to. All right, Jacqueline. Um, what do you think, Jeff? We'll we'll come come back in a minute or two. All right. Um, we now have uh, Jeffrey Ferris. Uh, What's that? Now I'm there. You're good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, two. Well, I don't think quick things or not. One. I just wanted to back up some of Ann Lust's comments about not mixing bikes and pedestrians whenever possible, uh, particularly where you have dual paths along the stretch. Uh, preferable to not, you know, call the bike path a shared path, but just say it's a bike path. Uh, I hope you have some decent widths where it is indeed a shared path, at least 12 feet, maybe 15 feet. Um, second question area is, um, actually, do you want me to give you all the questions at once or do you want to answer one first? Hello? I'd say run down the list. <clears throat> okay. We'll go from um, there. The next one, um, the Emerald Necklace Master Plan calls for using some part of either Parkman Drive or Prince Street to complete a bicycle loop around the pond. That would complete the bike path along Jamaica Way and the bike lanes on Parkman Drive, not Parkman Drive, on uh, what's over there, Perkins Street. Um, any thought into uh, a bike route 
on that third leg around the pond using Parkman or Prince Street? It's a great idea, not part of this project. We can certainly have that conversation. I, I'd like to get through this one, um, but we can do that, have that conversation in parallel, but it wouldn't be part of this project. Yeah, well, just it does intersect the Kelly Circle area. And it's been the master plan for close to 30 years, so we're we're waiting for that conversation. And then uh, is, is the more detailed analysis available on the website, backup material for all of this, Patrick, whatever? I'm not sure if it's on the website. Uh, maybe Jeff or Jen, you can uh, 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 answer that. But uh, we have done our analysis. Everything. Uh, oh, you're talking about analysis or um, yes. everything that's been presented here, uh, as well as the handouts that are in the handout section here, are posted on. Will be posted on the website. They will be. So they're not there yet. Um, tomorrow they will be. Okay. Thank you. Actually, you know what? The um, the handouts are already there. Great. And then something about the separating the bikes and peds and the path widths. Sure. So, so that that's a great question, and and in, and it leads into you know how much width we have to work with, and and what's the balance between impacting existing <clears throat> excuse me trees along the arboy as as well as is is capitalizing on on what you've mentioned is trying to separate modes as, as much as we can, uh, and so. Even looking at the the carriageways, which we're we're focusing on repurposing for for local traffic and then reallocating some of that space uh, for that separated facility, uh, we're looking at you know spaces anywhere from 14, 15 feet uh, from the curb to the to the back of the the shared facility. So um, in some places we're more constrained than others. In, in some places we're able to get up to that, that 12 to to higher foot facility, especially within uh, getting down to the Arboy south of Murray Circle uh, in some of these concepts where we're trying to, to relocate traffic to a single barrel. Uh, we have that buffer. We can make an, a nice, quality, comfortable facility uh, while still trying to, to balance the modes and, and the traffic that we have along this corridor. So, so the intent is to, is to make sure that we're, we're definitely going above the minimum and, and trying to provide a quality facility uh, on every segment just so you don't feel unsafe if you're traveling north-south. So great question. And, and you know, on, on the widths, um, I, it, this isn't usually done. It, it seems typically when they do pads, they make it the narrowest width that fits through everything or the widest that fits through everything. But if the width varies so you can get around the tree without taking it down, I think that's that's perfectly fine. It can meander around things. And I hope you don't do what the Army Corps of Engineering did down across the Landmark Center and plop their uh, traffic control devices right in the middle of the bike path. Great comment, and that's that, that's not our intent here. To make sure the landscape uh, designers are communicating with the traffic engineers. That's why you heard from both tonight. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Will do. Thanks, Jeff. All right, NL, your next one, sir. Um, the next one is about the shared street. With alternative C, instead of a separated bike and pedestrian way, there's an 18 foot wide shared street. I've seen these work in Europe, but I don't trust them with Boston drivers. How will you make sure Boston drivers don't mow down all the bikers and walkers? Great question. So, so the intent of the shared street is to make it safe for everyone, just as you had mentioned on that question. Uh, and, and our focus on trying to put uh, the through traffic on the main barrel of the carriageway uh, allows us to encourage uh, only local traffic to use those shared streets to begin with. So we'd be reducing speeds as well as potential volume. Uh, as you can, you'll see in more detail when, you're, when you have some time to, to look through some of these plans is that the connections too are not uh, a bypass connection. So we're not looking to, to provide those shared streets as a bypass route so people can try to speed down through them. Uh, and so even though in the other alternatives we're providing an 18 foot width to make sure that we can provide enough space for emergency vehicles, uh, the width here you know, might be a little bit different, uh, especially because we're trying to build those chicanes and, and still make sure that we can get you know, your normal delivery vehicles through here safely without damaging equipment or not able to visibly see people uh, as they're navigating through the corridor. So, 
So it's absolutely a balance and, and, and we're gonna think on this in more detail if this is you know, the preferred alternative that's, the, that's chosen. So thank you for that question. I also just wanted to add in, this is Amy, um, that uh, it's not technically a shared street, but there's a street over in Newton, I'm sure you guys have been on, that functions a bit that way. Uh, Com Ave in Newton in certain parts has the carriageway um, that does allow vehicular traffic, but a lot of people um, bike both ways on it, which technically is not legal, but they do it. And people will run out and run on it instead of the sidewalks because the sidewalks are quite narrow. So, um, and I think if you uh, ask a lot of the people who live there, that that does actually function quite well for them. Um, so I, you know, I think it's possible. Okay. Next hand up is from John Salzberg. John, you need to. Uh, you got. Okay. So if you look flat to where I live, it's a we have a corner of Pond and Main Street. And um, you can see where Pond comes in to the Jamaica Way that there's frequently, at least when there isn't COVID, a big backup, particularly during rush hour, of traffic that comes down from Brookline um, into the Jamaica Way. As far as I can tell by uh, eliminating streets, you're going to get even more of a backup. What that means to me is not just the cars that are there, but the fumes that are there, the noise of people beeping horns. Um, it is, I can only picture this getting extremely worse. I'm also very concerned about the fact that I think that what's going to happen when we reduce these lanes is you're going to have all this traffic in the middle. Now, when you have traffic in the middle, you don't have a barrier in between them. I mean, everybody's going to be just like on the rest of the Jamaica way, two lanes facing two lanes, uh, which just, I think, increases uh, the possibility of serious accidents. Uh, keep in mind that there is never, and I say never, any traffic enforcement on this road. And nothing is going to change. So there's no place for a state trooper to park themselves in your configuration to keep track of speeders, they won't do it, it's dangerous, and they're not going to do it now. And I think you're going to find that there's going to be increased accidents and increased deaths, or anything not to be the worst, but it's just the reality of it. And I also think you're going to have backups. If you have people crossing the street down by the road lake going toward West Roxbury, in order to cross over the breakaway, you're going to have to stop all the traffic. It's not just half the traffic, right? If you go to cross, you want to stop all the traffic, and that's going to cause even more of a backup. So I think what you're going to have, and I, don't know, I guess if I have a question, it's what have you done to really determine what the backups are going to be and the traffic coming from Boston toward West Roxbury, coming from Brookline at very rush hour, um, and what do you think the effect is going to be? Do you think it's going to be negligible? Or do you think it's going to be significant? And does it matter? So, John, your audio was pretty distorted, but I think I understand the main idea of your question, which is you are very concerned about movement along both the Jamaica Way and the Arbor Way, particularly with regard to traffic signals based on queuing that you've seen at Elliott. And I will say to you that one thing that DCR has not done a good job of, and, and most of this is most of this, uh, most of this is my fault being responsible for the Parkways program, is to design the signal system so that movement can progress in a thoughtful way in both directions, given the constraints of the roadway that we have along the Jamaica Way and the Arbor Way. Obviously, with most of the, or I guess two of the three of the alternatives that we've shown you tonight. We are making use of traffic signals, which is a, a good tool to use for several reasons. One is that with good traffic engineering and good progression along several signals in a row, is that you can program the signals at a certain speed. So for example, if we choose 25 miles an hour, so this is a good example that we're showing right now. Signal at Elliott, signal at Prince, and then another one at the end of the carriageway, 
you can progress those so that one turns on if you're driving 25 miles an hour you get a green light when you get to the next one and so on and so on and so on and the drivers will learn that if they keep their speed at what we want them to at 25 they won't have to stop there's no point in speeding up to 30 or 35 if you're just going to stop at the next signal so if we can get the if we can get drivers to learn to do that that reduces speeds running speeds along the corridor and in turn the reduced speeds usually results in fewer crashes and uh, less severity of crashes when they do occur. So those, all of those things combined, I think, get us to the result that we want along the Arbor Way, uh, which is a more calm movement to keep the volume of, of traffic that we do have, to keep them moving, to keep the line moving at 25 so that they don't have to stop and start, and go zero to 30 to 40 to zero, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and keep them going at 25 all along the corridor. They maintain their travel time. They never go too fast for the roadway. But if you reduce some of the lanes, I hope you can hear me, but reduce some of the lanes that I have, where are all those cars going to be backing up? And they're going to be backing up into my neighborhood, certainly, and my neighbors who are concerned about this. Yeah, so I think you're asking about the eight lane section. So as we as we showed you before, and as we all know, the section in between Kelly and Murray Circle is eight lanes across. That's a lot of lanes. I think that we can all count on one hand how many roadways we can imagine within the 128 corridor that has eight lanes across. Uh, Route 2 in Belmont, Southeast Expressway, parts of 128, 93 north, 93 north of Boston. Uh, they're all interstate highways with the exception of Route 2. This is the only surface roadway that I can think of in Metro Boston that has eight lanes across. Eight lanes can carry, at a maximum, 16,000 vehicles an hour. We have a, a number of counts that Bob talked about earlier. We have nowhere near 16,000 vehicles per hour on the Arbor Way, on any section. So what that points to is we need somewhere between six lanes and four lanes to carry the volumes that we had pre, pre pandemic. And what we're showing you on all. Jeff, we've lost your sound. Jeff, we've lost your sound. Thank you. Hey, Jeff. Jeff. We can't hear you, Jeff. You can't hear us either. He hasn't stopped on you. Jeff, we've lost. We'll get we'll get him back. We'll get him back for you, John. I'm gonna are you messaging him, Jenny? Sorry about that, folks. Um, NL, why don't you read your next question and maybe hopefully Matt Jasmine can get it for us. Sure. Yeah, these are uh, both bike bike comments and questions. Um, so either Matt or Amy, we'll all look to you all. Um, the first is, it looks to me as though Alternative C provides the best improvements for cyclists. Is that the opinion of, is that the opinion of the project staff? And then the second is, please describe uh, or uh, the second is, all three options rely heavily on 10-foot share use paths. Can you describe the level of effort made to separate bicycle traffic from pedestrians? As we are seeing along the Esplanade, 10-foot shared use paths present many conflicts between the modes. This is especially an issue for people with visual or hearing disabilities. Yeah, so I think there there's two pieces in there, and, and, and Amy, you can supplement you know, anywhere around light is <clears throat> there's a significant amount of interchangeability between these alternatives and the intent is to 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 match or do better than what we're tying into north south and and, and just like uh jeff Ferris had brought up is you know where you can uh, maximize the amount of space so you eliminate that conflict between modes uh, and, and one of the things that we're here today is to hear, hear your comments. What you think about? What do you think about shared use paths? What do you think about separated bike lanes? Uh, especially when we're tying into different contexts like the Emerald Necklace paths, 
uh, just north of Kelly Circle, right? What is what does that interaction happen where you have a shared use path coming into our project limits? Uh, what do you want to see there, and, and and what do you think is is the appropriate solution? Uh, so, level of effort is is trying to we focused on developing these concepts and trying to balance uh, the existing pavement width with providing safe and, and efficient access for all modes. So as much as we can maintain the character of the corridor and not impact uh, very large and robust existing trees, uh, we tried to focus on doing that. We know that whenever you're doing construction adjacent to mature trees, uh, there's a risk of impacting uh, those trees. And, and we want to make sure that by by really focusing on building this as a parkway, that we're, we're limiting the, the stress and the hazard uh, to the existing trees and green space while we provide this robust connection. So great question and, and thank you for it. Yeah, just one thing to add to that. Um, one part of the question was, I think uh, saying that C seemed to be the, the best for cyclists and did we agree? Um, I can't say that I can pick one alternative that is the best for cyclists. We tried to make them all as good for all users as possible, but I, what I would kind of answer that with is uh, kind of another question, if you could reply in the chat or however is possible for you, like what about um, alternative C uh, makes you think that it is the best for cyclists? As, as Matt said, um, you know, the, a lot of these parts are interchangeable. And so uh, the best feedback we can get is going to be specific about what elements uh, you think are the best uh, for cyclists or pedestrians or whatever, whatever the case may be. So we really would like to know what it is. Um, if it's everything, great, but you know, uh, as specific as you can be would be helpful. Thank you. All right, so the next question is from, um, it says Michael Tyskind with a T, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna bet myself a quarter that it's actually Michael Reiskind. So Michael, you're self muted at this time, but you also took your hand down. So it, it's not like an auction. If you don't wanna talk, you haven't bid, so. Yep, there we okay. go. Okay, I'm here. Um, yes, I don't know how I got to beat Michael Tyson. Um, the um, I might have been misreading the uh, maps, but in all the alternatives, it seems to me that the carriageways, both northbound and southbound, are dead end or cul-de-sac streets. If so, how do uh, deliveries and vehicles get to some of the houses? And if it's not a cul-de-sac, can you improve the maps uh, so that it shows how those carriageways uh, merge into the uh, main barrels? Sure, and great, great question there. So the last thing that we want to do is is dead end those those streets, especially when we're trying to focus on providing local access uh, to to each of those abutting houses, as, as well as the connecting side streets to them. Uh, so all of them do have access uh, uh, to to one of the connecting streets. Uh, in some alternatives, it's directly to and from the main barrel. In other alternatives like this, it's connecting uh, to the north, where we have the Francis Parkman Drive uh, signalized intersection, uh, as well as the, the Pond Street and Cotomet uh, signalized intersection. Uh, for the northbound carriageway in this option, it's also connecting right into the eastern side of, uh, of Prince Street. Uh, to that signalized intersection that leaves Murray Circle uh, on Center Street. So there is uh, definitely north-south connection, connectability for, for each of these directions, but they are a single direction of flow. Uh, so we can definitely clarify that. There's a couple of trees that overhang that we want to make sure were, were visible okay. as well. So they are cul-de-sacs? They are not cul-de-sacs. Well, it shows the carriageway southbound ending in a design opportunity it looks like they're completely dead-ended right so the, the I'll, I'll highlight it with the, the spotlight too um, so for to make sure that we're providing access to all the different abutters there's a, in a driveway that circulates right past where we thought was a safe access point to the main barrel so this leg right here provides that access while still highlighting a, a, a crossing for pedestrians and bikes across this leg to the main barrel it's a great question. So it is a dead end there. No, it, allows, dead ends, it dead really ends at the design opportunity. It allows us for access to this last abutter, but they have bi-directional access to this leg. 
But the carriageway dead ends there. No, the carriageway provides access to the main barrel here. Um, Matt, maybe you could show Michael with your pointer how a vehicle could progress down, just be in the carriageway southbound, and then get out. You know, no, from no, the no. I, I I understand that. It, but it looks okay. at the design opportunity. That is a dead end. Is that correct? Or the last abutter? Yes. That's where the road ends, but they can access the main barrel from that point. So sorry if that, that's not clear, you know, definitely be willing to talk to you after or or over email or, or written comment as well to clarify that. Well, just blow it up so it makes it clear on the map. And also on the northbound, it looks like it dead ends as well. Uh, how does the no where does the northbound come into the main barrel? So we'll see if this this helps a little bit. It's under a tree. It's hard to see it, but it's under a tree. Okay. Yeah, the map is not clear there. So one of the good things I think about the website, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nate Lash, but when you if you want to go leave your comments on the uh, social pinpoint site. You'll be able to zoom down to a fairly tight level um, and you know see through things like the tree that's here you know once you zoomed in you can see that there's the gray under the tree i think you know to matt's point we just wanted to be you know very respectful and provide a very given the importance of the trees especially with the comments about the gas leaks in this area you know we wanted to show that we weren't taking any of the trees that are out here um, and that are well-loved mature trees lightly um, so we're showing them all um, if we think that they're not impacted. Is that fair to say, Matt? Thank yeah, you, sir. Absolutely. All right, Anel, you want to go uh, check out your next one? Sure thing. Yeah, our next question uh, came in from Wendy Landman, but she also has her hand raised. So, Wendy, I'm just going to um, unmute your mic uh, so that you can ask your question um, over Great. the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm look, this is, first of all, thank you very much. I think that this is um, a pretty terrific set of opportunities here. And I want to first start by echoing uh, what Ann said and, and others about trying to make sure that walking and biking are separated in this corridor because there are a lot of people doing both. Um, and I have a question, which is from my look at these alternatives, is it correct that only alternative C, which eliminates both circles, that the pedestrians or bicyclists crossing the main barrel of the Arbor Way are protected, they have signalized crossings, that both of the others maintain unsignalized crossings of the main barrel of the Arbor Way? That's a great question. Um, and so one of the things that we want to make sure we do is, is in, enhance compliance with, with people trying to cross the street versus people trying to, uh, to drive through any of these areas. So especially at a multi-lane modern roundabout, we want to make sure that we're providing some type of uh, AD accessible actuated uh, method for, for people to cross the street. Amy had went through some of our different options in, the, in our toolbox, uh, and, and those are things that we're going to explore. Uh, but our intent is to is to encourage compliance for people to yield to pedestrians and bikes uh, by some type of actuated method, meaning that if you press a button, that something will will pop up to try to stop vehicles. So does that mean that at the, for example, vehicles leaving Murray Circle? and heading south on um, Center Street, I guess is the right way to describe it. Yeah, south on Center Street. So there's these, the two crossing, yeah, just south, just there, that there, those will have pedestrian actuated or bike actuated stop red lights. But Wendy, and, we haven't gotten, we, Wendy, we haven't gotten that yeah. far yet. Okay. Okay. The traffic control for the roundabout. I think a question came earlier about this too, about being nervous about stopping the vehicles coming on and off the road or the roundabout. Right. And so that that treatment is something that we're going to have to be very, very careful about 
um, and balance the needs, the safety needs of the pedestrian, the bicycle, and to make sure we keep the line moving. That's one of the big design challenges of a modern roundabout, and it'll be one of the biggest trade-offs that we'll have to make here. The traffic signal that you see in alternative C is a little more straightforward. That's a traditional stop and go intersection. All the, the pedestrian crossings, there it is. They'll all have uh, pedestrian signals, walk, flash, and don't walk, don't walk in this option. Uh, but with the modern roundabout, it's, it's a little more nuanced than that. So as we develop the design, we're going to have to find the right balance. I don't know if stopping the vehicles entering and exiting the roundabout is the right treatment, but it doesn't mean it isn't. We can talk through it and see if we can do it uh, and get both. Um, so I think to answer your question, I think we need to discuss it more. Um, but it, the so that so the alternatives B and C, A and B are have to be developed more. But alternative C is as definite that we would have uh, stop and go pedestrian signals at all four crossings. Okay, I guess I would. So thank you very much, Jeff. And I would request that um, if the if you move forward, looking at the the alternatives that have the roundabout that you not only do some discussion of what that how those might operate but actually get some operational examples um and in particular think about um how they work for uh uh folks who have low vision or or are blind who are crossing the street because that has been something that's come up in a lot of places as being um very problematical Oh, thank you. And just to add one more, I, and I'm sure you've seen it, Wendy, but MassDOT has just released a few weeks ago a roundabout design guide, which um, is excellent. And it's certainly something that we, once we get to the design development, we'll make heavy use of. But it's it's a public document, and any of you can take a close look at it and see what you think about the elements in there. Uh, and so that that will help us that will help guide our discussion as to what the treatment should be here. It's a great resource, and we're lucky to have it at this. It's a perfect timing for our project. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jeff. Just to add something to that, especially when it comes to the visibility of the signals uh, for anybody crossing those crosswalks, we are bound to follow the ADA uh, uh, um, requirements for such crosswalks. So. When it comes to those signals themselves, we have to make sure they can be visible either by contrast or uh, either by sound or whatnot. We we have to make sure that uh, it meets those ADA requirements. So if there's anybody with any um, uh, vision visibility, any uh, physical uh, um, um, disability, uh, we we accommodate for them as well. Uh, that's a standard that we have to follow no matter what. So. Uh, we always take them into consideration. We always take that uh, type of use into consideration. It's not a second thought or not. It's uh, right. how we design. No, I, I understand. And um, it's just there's in the in the walking advocacy community, there's a lot of skepticism about uh, these two lane uh, roundabouts that they actually ever are comfortable for pedestrians. So. Anyway, but thank you very much. I know you're being thoughtful about how you're doing this, so thank you. Thanks, Certainly, Wendy. Thank you. All right, so um, NL, I'm gonna go to, um, I think since we made a text question into a speech question, I'm gonna go to um, Ned Elmore. Um, we're at uh, 8.38, these are good questions. We are starting to lose some segments of the audience. It's dropping off. Um, Jeff, um, you're the captain of the boat here. How much longer do you wanna go, my friend? I'll I'll go all night if you want me to. Let's uh, let's take two more and see where, where we are. That would take us to 8.45. Very good. All right, Ned Elmore, you are good to go. Your microphone is green, Ned. Ned, are you with us? All right. Uh, and Al, why don't you read the next text one, and we'll see if Ned comes in. Sure. Um, so we got two that came in about Murray Circle specifically, um, and also about the roundabout. So um, the first is, can you talk through Murray Circle a little bit more and 
um, and talk about the trade-offs between the three designs. Um, and then the second was, um, can you talk high level about what's known from other projects about pedestrian and cycle crossings um, and their proximity to the roundabout? So right at the roundabout or further away? Uh, let me uh, let me start and if anybody else wants. Uh, just, I'm, I'm so glad we're talking about trade-offs because this is exactly where we are at this stage of the project. The, this, and I forgot to say it in my opening remarks, but Murray Circle is probably our biggest design challenge because of the huge trade-offs that we have here. So the first trade-off is trees. There are some really lovely trees, very big, mature trees in the middle of the circle. As you see on this slide here with, with option A, almost all of those are retained. But if you go to option C, that we could not find a way to retain those trees because unfortunately they're in our way if we want to build a traditional four-way intersection. So that's that's big trade-off number one. So if you're if you really are um, if you really like those existing trees there, you probably wouldn't want to support this alternative C. The other set of alternatives are about pedestrian and bicycle movement. So for vehicle movements, we can make the intersections work either way. So that once we get down to the traffic engineering part, when when Bob sits down and does the the the, the uh, advanced math on how to get them to work from a vehicle standpoint, he can do that for either one. For pedestrians and bicycles, there this is the other trade-off. If starting here with the roundabout, as as Wendy talked about a minute ago, the crossing for pedestrians, so you would be faced with crossing a uh, crossing two lanes with some traffic control device that we haven't decided yet. It's either a flashing yellow light or it's a red light or it's some something like that. Um, but we're not, we don't know if we can provide a red light and a walk signal here for the crossings on the length of the roundabout. And as an aside, the, the research about whether the crosswalk should be right in the circle or a little bit away from the circle, that depends a little bit on the nuances of the geometrics and the design to make sure there's enough uh, an open sight line and the speeds are being reduced as the vehicle either approaches from either the inside of the circle or from the outside. Um, but uh, from a, a traditional traffic signal, which is option C, then the pedestrian and the bicycle will have a walk signal or a bicycle signal on all four sides of the intersection. And we will do our absolute best to make sure, and I think we can achieve this, to make sure that pedestrians and bicycles do not encounter a turning vehicle, which some intersections in Boston do have, and elsewhere on the parkway system too. But I think we can design this intersection so that the pedestrian and bicycle will have free use of that space within the, within the crosswalk or the bike area and not have to worry about vehicles turning right or left. That's a goal that I have. I don't know if we can deliver that uh, at this point, but that uh, that is something that's very important to me. Um, so th those are the two big sets of trade-offs that I see for Murray Circle. And I think no matter which way we go, uh, we're going to have to make some compromises here when we get to our final preferred, um, preferred alternative. All right, great. Thank you, Jeff. So Sarah Freeman, you are up. Sarah, you're stuck. Hi, did I unmute myself correctly? You did. You, you nailed it. Spot of the land. You. Okay, I'll try to be fast. Um, thank you all. This is very uh, exciting, interesting, scary uh, to try to weigh all the pros and cons. So um, first comment, I'm thrilled that they're interchangeable because there are so many parts. It's kind of like a Mr. Potato Head, if any of you remember that game. Um, I want to uh, implore the most self-enforcing as possible, uh, echoing what someone said earlier about not trusting motorists to want to put pedal to the metal. Um, I'm aware of a desire for Murray Circle as a U-turn opportunity for someone on Center Street, like by the farmhouse, to be able to turn right, go around and come. If you're trying to turn left, but you can't do it from 
your start, will will these options like the signal, how would someone change direction? Can someone I don't know if I described it well, but no, no, uh, is enough, uh, Sarah. This is Bob. Uh, we're we are looking for the feasibility of U-turns at the signal um, in case people needed to turn around right there, because uh, uh, yeah, definitely coming, especially coming out of the carriageways and trying to cross four lanes of traffic just to get to the opposite direction. That's very scary. Um, uh, but it is done in Murray. You're provided with that U-turn. Uh, depending on the alternative you you choose with uh, Kelly, there's uh, another way to make uh, such a movement to uh, go the opposite direction. Great. And last, um, anywhere that is different movement than currently, can you add arrows like the woman that asked about Pond Street? Is especially for people who weren't here tonight and are trying to interpret on their own. Um, you mean just on the graphics to clarify the movements, uh, Sarah? Yeah, like I see okay. there are some arrows, but that yeah. one in particular okay. for people coming down Pond Street, if it's different than what they are accustomed to, it would be good to, to make that obvious. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right, do we have time for uh, two more, Jeff? All right, Nate, just for you, two more. All right, and I'll read one more. <laughs> All righty. Um, I guess the last text question of the night is, um, is it correct that in alternative C, all of the parking along the Arboretum is eliminated? Um, and maybe Matt, it would be helpful to just sort of have that conversation about all of the alternatives. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, so this is one of the alternatives where we do uh, remove the parking adjacent to the Arboretum just because of visibility or, or speed concerns. Uh, we are gaining back a lot of that space, so that doesn't mean with uh, with adjusting the design that the parking can't be maintained if it's if it's definitely something an amenity that that should be kept. Uh, we acknowledge that there's safety challenges too of having parking uh, along a horizontal horizontal curve, especially leaving a signalized intersection or or a roundabout or the existing rotaries. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to, to identify is, is, is what would it look like without parking along that stretch? And, and how does that balance the, the safety and accessibility uh, for different users? So great questions. So uh, as much as we can, we're, we're looking to maintain parking where it exists today. Uh, if there's, <clears throat> you know, people that are parking in places where, where they're not supposed to or it's causing a potential safety hazard, we're going to be evaluating that to, to ensure that the product that gets put out uh, is, is safe for all users and that we're not uh, encouraging a, an unsafe condition. So thank you for that. All right, so our last hand for the night before we hand it back to Jeff and Jenny to wrap us up and remind us of the comment deadline and show everybody where to go um, to submit their comments is Sophia Lingos. Sophia, you're you're on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Thank you so much for everything you've been doing for us. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you could please display alternative C nearest to Murray Circle, I think it'll be most helpful in my commentary. I'm a multimodal user from walking, baby carriages, riding, and you know, my bike living here specifically. Um, Oh, wait, opposite circle. I'm sorry. Opposite Kelly? Circle. Yes, please. Sorry. <laughs> the one with the pot. So, uh, no, well, it doesn't look right. Okay. So, at the end of the Arbor Way, on when you're looking at on alternative C, that's why it looks confusing. Alternative C, please. At the end of it, when you're heading southbound, on alternative C. So alternative C heading southbound. It's unclear uh, what happens to the homes at the end of alternative C heading southbound before the circle, not no before the circle.
in the carriage, uh, in the carriage lane when you right here see where that star is that's mm -hmm. what my question is regarding so um how would homeowners access and egress their homes is my question number one and my question number two is what do you mean by that star in front of it what is what is the proposed design opportunities so that's one of those areas that we'll clarify um, with, with some of the updated versions of the concepts. Uh, but in this section where it, 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 it does illustrate you know, a cul-de-sac, that allows for bi-directional access for that, those homes there merging back into the main barrel of the carriageway. So for the majority of the length of this carriageway going southbound, uh, it's single direction. But to make sure that we're maintaining access to that stretch, uh, it could be bi-directional. The location of that connection uh, could be relocated, <clears throat> but the, the biggest goal is trying to be sensitive of accessibility for all users, as well as tying into the main barrel appropriately. So that big star is just uh, one of those components that, that Rich Houghton from, from Halverson had talked about, not necessarily to put something within the footprint of the roadway, uh, but maybe at the, uh, at the gateway entrance to that shared use path or separated bike line. Uh, could there be a resting area? Could there be some type of amenity uh, for users as they are going north or south? So, so there's absolutely nothing in the design concept that will take away our driveways or our access to our homes. No, that, that's a great question. And so the intent is to not uh, eliminate any access to any abutting homes. And so everyone who lives along the carriageways will be able to exit and access the Arbor Way uh, as they would today going southbound or going northbound. I think that one of your goals is to try to make getting out of those driveways more comfortable. I mean, I know we've talked about it. Is that a safe assessment to say that? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's a very good point is, is once we bring the intent of slowing vehicular traffic down uh, and then trying to avoid backing up into high speed traffic uh, or multi lanes of traffic, uh, it should be more comfortable to, to, to be able to navigate in and out of those driveways safely. So great question and thank you for that. Thank you for your time. All right. Jeff and Jenny, it's all you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thanks for staying on late, especially members of the panel. I know we are, we're we're uh, way over time, but I think um, it was worthwhile. We had a lot of excellent questions and good comments tonight. And we really do look forward to your written comments and your comments on the social pinpoint that was a great tool for us when we started as, as nate said earlier we had over 500 comments on the first time around i think this time we'll have a lot more uh, and i know we only had time to get to a couple dozen of you tonight that's just a matter of us uh, having limited time but your written comments will be extremely valuable and uh, please um don't hesitate to tell us anything you want. I apologize that my microphone cut out earlier when we were talking about traffic volumes. I know that's a very important point, and I'd like to continue that discussion. Those of you that are concerned about volumes, please write to us and, and say that you're concerned about the volumes, and we'll have an interaction about uh, what we're doing as a design team and what it means for you and for the neighborhood. Uh, so please, anything that you're concerned about, please let us know. And between now in the end of the of the comment period uh, and even beyond we'll be able to have an interaction and, and talk about these things and and what this is not our last meeting of course we'll be back before you again when it's appropriate probably after the holidays um but um we look forward to seeing you again and uh, and i'll turn it back over to jenny for some final words uh thanks jeff uh one comment um i believe nate pointed it out earlier december is a typo uh, we apologize the, uh, the comment period actually ends Friday, November 6th. Uh, we'll make that change in this presentation before we post it um, to the website tomorrow. You will all get uh, an email tomorrow once everything's posted. Um, all of the handouts that you see um, in the uh, go to webinar toolbar are already posted there, uh, all of these links, and uh, this recording will also be posted there. Um, so please, please, as Jeff said, uh, submit your comments. Um, we do take them all very seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got a couple of different options for doing that.
do we have another slide or are we done? I think we're done. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful night. Great. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.